Syria's Bashar al-Assad gets some unusual public support. A U.S. congressman says he's good to his country's Christians. But is it true? I'm Imran Gata, and today's newsmakers are Syria's Christians. Well, if you ask California Republican Dana Robacher, Christians in the Middle East have no better friend than Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian strongman at the helm of a bloody conflict that has killed hundreds of thousands of people. Many of those have been Christian. But during a debate over new sanctions, Robacher came to Assad's defense, saying Syria is the only place in the region where Christians can be safe. And while his comments were widely criticized, Lebanon, after all, has a Christian president, others have made similar claims in support of Assad. Some have alleged overthrowing him would mean Al-Qaeda could more easily target Christians. But are they right? Natalie Pohonen reports. These five Christian men were abducted by Al-Qaeda-linked fighters about four years ago. This ceremony in Damascus in April marked the start of their final journey to their homes in Malula. It's a place where Aramaic, the language from biblical times, is still spoken. And it's also a community which was targeted for its faith, changing hands many times during the war. Syrian regime forces recaptured it from what was then the Nusra Front in 2014. And while many of its churches and sacred sites were reduced to rubble, it proved an important political victory for Bashar al-Assad, in which he could be viewed as a protector of the Christian minority. And some locals praised him for it. But regime forces have been responsible for shelling at least 40 churches since 2011, proof that Christian places of worship are not free from the regime's military might. Syria's Christian community goes back 2,000 years. When the revolution began, they made up about 10% of the population. And like their Muslim neighbors, they have been the target of sectarian violence as well as victims of the regime. We always pray on this occasion for peace and security, to return to our country and for the old days when we used to all live together as one. During the conflict, Assad has been keen to show he's a supporter. Christians have been offered a degree of protection in regime-held areas where they can openly worship. But Christian activists were targets of Assad's forces before the war, and that's placed the minority in a precarious position in which the regime, which did use sectarian divisions in the past, is now seen by some as a preserver of the faith. Daesh and groups aligned with Al-Qaeda have deliberately targeted Christians and other religious minorities, in some cases forcing people to convert or face the threat of execution. And while Muslims make up the majority of victims in the Syrian war, the fate of Christian minorities has gained global prominence. The one thing that we can know about Assad, and he's a bad guy, but we know that he's not such a bad guy that he that Syria under his leadership is recognized and has been recognized by the Christians throughout the Middle East as the only place they could go and seek refuge. But is the Assad regime truly protecting Syria's Christians or its own political interests? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, let's pick up the conversation with our panel. From Stuttgart, Germany, Kevor Kalmasian. He's the managing director of Syriana Analysis, a platform providing information around Syrian current affairs. And from Brussels, we're joined by Kawa Hassan. He's the director of the Middle East and Northern Africa program at the East West Institute. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Kevor Kalmasian, let's begin with you. Is Assad a protector of Christians and other minorities in Syria? Actually, uh, President Bashar Assad is not only a protector of the minorities. We have 
a very important equation in Syria that says when 50 plus 1 percent of the Sunni Muslims in Syria are against the government in Syria, the government will eventually fall. So basically, President Bashar Assad has support from various groups in Syria, not only from the minorities, ethnic or sectarian minorities, but also from a broader spectrum, which is the Sunni Muslims in Syria. So President Bashar Assad at the moment that is fighting a war against, let's say, takfiri groups that target everybody that is against their ideology, Wahhabi ideology. Uh, so by doing so, President Bashar Assad is being a protector of Syrians who believe in the Syrian identity as, as, as a broader identity, not uh, identifying themselves as a Sunni, Shia, Alevi, or Christians. So President Bashar Assad has a political project which is uh, trying to uh, empower and 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 uh, promote the identity, the Syrian identity among the Syrians. Uh, that this identity that collects everybody together in order to live uh, together in harmony without wars in the future. Okay, so Kawa Hassan, he might be a bad guy according to some responsible for many of the 400,000 deaths, but he has a project that's only against takfiri groups, as Kevok mentioned. He doesn't want to attack anybody on the outside. So in that sense, he's a protector of Christians and other minorities. What do you think, Kawa? Thank you very much for having me. I think uh, there are a couple of myths which need to be deconstructed in this discussion. And first is the issue of, you know, being the protector of, of minorities, but also in this case, as was uh, said by the other panelists, uh, you know, all Syrians. I think when it comes to the issue of, you know, protection of, of, of Christians, um, uh, I think the, uh, the reality is much more complex on the ground. If you, uh, if we can have, uh, you know, um, an interesting analysis, uh, uh, which would do justice to the realities on the ground. We see that some Christians do support the, um, the, 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 uh, the Assad regime, the state. Others uh, support the opposition. And perhaps the majority is neutral for uh, reasons which I will explain uh, very briefly. Uh, first of all, um, uh, there is definitely a legitimate fear from the jihadi Salafism and Takfiri ideology, not only against Christians, but also uh, above all, against you know uh, Sunnis who do not agree with the Salafi and Takfiri ideology of ISIS and other groups. So that is definitely a legitimate fear. But I think if you go back to history, recent history, uh, and also after the start of the protests in Syria, there has been a systemic exploitation and appropriation of this fear by by the government in order to uh, you know strengthen their hold on on the society. So, um, and, and I can give a couple of examples of, you know, people, you know, from Christian background who are activists. I mean, you've got Michel Kilo, you've got George Sabra, who are prominent members in the Syrian opposition, political mm -hmm. opposition. You have also civil society activists, you know, people who from uh, Christian background, Khalil Ma'atouk, a very important human rights lawyer and human rights defender. You know, he has been arrested for, uh, for a long time and his, 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 his place is unknown to this day. You have also, uh, 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 Basil Shahad, a very prominent right. civil society activist, who at the start of the protest went to Homs to uh, document the, uh, the protest, the revolution through video, and then he was killed when the city was bombed. Okay. I, and there are, you know, I can give you know, okay. a list of so, other names. So let me, so let me take think... that and pose that to Kevok, right? So Kevok, a true test of whether Assad is a protector of Christians is, okay, if you're a Christian who rises up against him, how will you be treated? And it seems as if from the evidence on display that Christians who rose up against him faced the same fate as everybody else. They were either barrel bombed, tortured, shot. This example of Basil Shahada, his friends weren't even allowed to go to church to pray for his soul by Assad security forces. So that kind of weakens that theory, doesn't it, Kivok? Actually, since the beginning of the so-called revolution in Syria, the vast majority of the Christians, I mean, I'm, I, I was born and raised in a Christian community in Syria, so uh, the general mood in, in, in Syria since the beginning was, especially I'm speaking about the Christians now, were against the revolution for many objective reasons. One of the reasons is uh, the, the slogans, the undemocratic slogans that has been raised since the beginning of the, of the protest. The second is the sectarian rhetoric of, uh, of the opposition groups on the ground. Uh, 
uh, it's true that some activists have legitimate uh, demands and they were genuine in, in their demands from the Syrian government. However, those who were controlling uh, these people underground and namely uh, foreign governments in the region, they were feeding uh, sectarian slogans in these uh, in these groups. Not only slogans, but also acts, activities underground. Right. Okay. For example, uh, the attack. Uh, for example, the attack on Maalula City. It has mm -hmm. no uh, strategic importance whatsoever. Uh, they attacked the, uh, Maalula. They they tried to eliminate the Christians. The same thing is Maharde is happening right. in north uh, in North Hama in Idlib in Aleppo. Kevin, Armenians me, were targeted in Kassab. Let me ask uh, you about uh, the alternative. It's systematic. It's systematic. Sure. Okay, so let me ask you about the alternative, right? So it's one thing to say there's an existential fear. If you're in a Christian village and just around the corner is Nusra Front or Jabhat Fatah Sham, and they might kill you, so you want to be neutral or you might just sort of want to side with the regime possibly because you're not top of their list in terms of being killed. That's one thing. But on the other hand, saying the revolution's undemocratic, is it that much more undemocratic than Ba'athism, which in many ways is, is just a version of fascism? The Assad regime is not very democratic, is it? <laughs> Uh, in Syria, uh, Syria is not a Switzerland, of course, and uh, in Syria we have an uh, undemocratic political system, and that's why since the beginning I was enthusiastic, a little bit excited about the protest, uh, telling myself that this might bring a change to Syria, but these dreams uh, vanished very fast. At least after three months, there were many massacres happened, for example, in Jusr uh, uh, Many incidents happened against uh, many communities in Syria, including the Sunnis. Uh, for example, I just want to mention the this incident because it's personal. Uh, my brother was kidnapped by the moderate rebels that uh, many people like to call them, by the free Syrian army that uh, have the support and the, and the military support and financial support from many regional and international powers. They captured him because he's a Christian. He was tortured because he's a Christian. Uh, and we, we paid huge amount of ransom money for the free Syrian army in order to release him because they told us we will behead your brother unless you pay a big amount of ransom. So this is something happening in every day in Syria. You cannot make a revolution and call others to join your revolution while you are kidnapping them, killing them, slaughtering them, threatening them. You either join or we, you, we kill you. This is not a revolution anymore. This is terrorism. In, if, you, if we check all the previous historical revolutions, there is something called a Jacobian uh, force that the revolutionaries right. should force the people to join, but not true terrorism, okay, so not true take, car bombs, not let's true take what you said, uh, kidnappings. Sure. Okay, and you made some good points. Let's take what you said and pose it to Kawa. Kawa, you heard about Kevok's brother. Terrible situation with his brother. They tortured him and they had to pay ransom, right? In addition to that, when Aleppo was under siege, you had many Christians in West Aleppo who saw their churches, for example, shelled by rebels, who then saw the retaking of East Aleppo as a liberation by the regime because they were under threat from the rebels. Do you sympathize in any way with that perspective, Kawa? Well, I mean, uh, definitely there have been really, you know, uh, instances of kidnapping and torture also by, you know, some opposition groups uh, against Christians, but also against non-Christians and also against the Sunnis and, and Alawites and other groups. So, I mean, that can't be, you know, uh, disputed. Definitely, I agree with the panel, uh, the, the, the panelists. But what I disagree with is that, you know, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the narrative, the conventional wisdom about the Syrian conflict right now is that this is a sectarian conflict. And I think in a sense is not a sectarian conflict. And there are two groups which have a vested interest in perpetuating this perception, namely the, the Syrian regime and radical Islamist groups. And there is a third way, which is not sectarian, which is the vast majority of Syrians, including also Christians and other groups, which do not want a sectarian uh, Syria. And I think the, the, one of the reasons for the emergence of these jihadi Islamist groups is also the policy of the, you know, the Syrian regime over the last, even before the revolution, to encourage, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the emergence of these Islamist groups to, uh, you know, to fight uh, Juan and Muslimin and others. Definitely also, you know, some regional states also played a role in, you know, the empowerment of these apocalyptic, you know, uh, uh, sectarian, you know, uh, uh, Sunni groups like, uh, like, like uh, Jabhat Fatah Sham, like, like ISIS. But the root cause of the conflict, I think we have to go back to history, and that is lack of rule of law, democracy, 
and, uh, and, and, and you know, a freedom of expression. And when, when, when legitimate fears are exploited and manipulated by a regime in place, an authoritarian, rather than being addressed in a democratic way, then what we get is this current catastrophe in Syria. Right. So, Kevok, root causes, lack of democracy, lack of, lack of freedom of expression, you've got to toe the line, there's no freedom in the society. You, you, you agreed with that a bit earlier on. You said it's not Switzerland. You have that. And then, of course, right. empirically, if you just do the numbers, the vast majority of the 400,000 or so people who have been killed have been killed by Assad forces, by barrel bombs and so on. When you put those two together, can no, you... No, that... I mean, this is not... I'm not making up these figures, right? So the vast majority have been killed by Assad I, forces actually... through barrel bombs, through airstrikes, through mortar rounds and so on. With that in mind, is there, is there any point it would reach where you go, OK, hold on, maybe I shouldn't be supporting this guy anymore? Actually, uh, I agree with your, uh, with your guess that the Syrian government, since at least 40 years, uh, there, there was a lack of political participation, freedom of expression. We are all struggling uh, to get these freedoms in Syria. But the alternative that erupted this revolution in Syria were not democratic at all. I mean, they should have proven to us that they are democratic people and uh, they, uh, they will bring uh, uh, these values, democratic values in Syria. But they just did the opposite of what we were calling to, which is uh, to build uh, a better political system in Syria. Now, if you ask any uh, Syrian citizen in Syria, do you prefer the, the current Syrian government, which is undemocratic, but it gives you free education, free health care, and security, or uh, a free Syrian army or Jabhat al-Nusra or ISIS, I believe, in my opinion, the vast majority will choose the government because they have experienced this government and they know that this government is giving you uh, uh, several things, and, but on the other hand, you don't have a political freedoms. But in, on, on the other side, for example, in Idlib, today they call it the candle of the revolution in Syria. Just check the, the documentary that has been released, uh, published by uh, an Emirati uh, channel a few days ago. The life in Idlib is miserable. There is no democracy. Women have no rights. They, they are imposed to wear burqa. Uh, they don't go to school. Foreign multinational terrorists uh, f uh, fighting and uh, controlling all this uh, all this area so this myth of a revolution is over now in Syria people have to choose uh, uh, you have the Syrian government that represents the multicultural and multi uh, polar society and this is all proven the Syrian government will love you and like you as long as you are loyal to it regardless of your sect or religion that's why it's not sectarian the the Syrian government problem with the the, the opposition groups is political not sectarian on the other hand the, the, these jihadi groups on the ground, they have the upper hand. I mean, uh, everybody can say there is a Kevok, Michel Pino, you, are Arif they, Dalila, are there any moderate, uh, George Saba, all these Christians, are there any but they have no rebels say in your eyes? on the ground. Sure. Are there any moderate rebels in your eyes? Is there I, anyone who's fighting a legitimate cause? In, Maybe maybe Hello? one or two percent of the fighters uh, now now at the moment they have uh, let's say legitimate uh, um, I mean demands but uh, uh, they are all fighting under the umbrella of the jihadi okay. groups without Kawa, these jihadi groups okay they so let's get Kawa's have response no say to that. in the Syrian Kawa, conflict. only one or two percent have a righteous and justified fight according to Kevok. What do you think? Well, I, 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 I don't know how, uh, you know, uh, uh, the guest has come up with this um, percentage. I think uh, if you go back to the start of, um, of the protest, you know, and the call for more democracy and rule of law in Syria, if I'm not mistaken, really, the majority of Syrians wanted a dignified democratic life in Syria. Uh, definitely there are, you know, radical jihadi groups which are not, not, not moderate. They are against also Sunnis and, and, and other groups. But I think, if I may, just to comment on one issue, and that is, you know, the regime is not democratic, but it provides free education and public services. I think, the, you know, the, 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 the pre-revolution authoritarian bargain whereby the regime would provide for, you know, these social economic rights and in turn will take your political rights is no, is no longer there. It has collapsed. The regime is no longer capable even to provide basic security for, you know, some of its own people. What we see on the ground is both in the opposition areas, but also in the regime held areas, increased fragmentation, you know, which, which has split the Syrian society to the core. So, and, Kawa, uh, Kawa Kevok was 
was talking case, about see, free, free school and free health care. I just want to comment, uh, Kawa, I just want to comment uh, on Kawa, one thing uh, let, me, let me bring in Kawa just for a second, and I'll, and I'll bring you back, Kevok. Uh, Kawa, mm. Kevok mentioned free school, free health care, and so on, for people who toe the line. Is that true or is that a myth, Kawa? No, I mean, in the past it was true. You know, definitely there was, you know, um, I mean, as I, I, I mean, it, you know, I, I just spoke about the authoritarian bargain, which was there in the 70s and 80s, up, up until 90s, where, you know, the state, the so-called developmental state, would provide for certain socioeconomic rights, certain, and, in, you know, in, in, in turn, you would have to concede all your political rights. But we should not forget that also, you know, uh, that was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, that, that authoritarian bargain after, you know, it, it's, it's, it's no longer there. It doesn't work anymore. And that's why people in Syria, in Tunisia, in other countries, they rose up against the regime because at some point, you know, and we should not forget also the issue of corruption in Syria, but also in other countries, which has led also one of the, you know, root causes for the, for the popular protests in Syria. So I think, you know, uh, uh, to, to say that, yes, the regime is not democratic, but it can provide public services, it doesn't, okay. it's not accurate. So and let's it, ask it, Kevok. And, and even that assumption is no longer, you know, there. Okay, so Kevok, that assumption's no longer there. Up this idea this that moment, you can keep people's stomachs up. full uh, in order to be semi-slaves, it doesn't work anymore. You're talking about an old Syria. Oh, no. <laughs> this, is, this is not about the slavery. I mean, the socialist system, socialist economy will provide, up till this moment, the Syrian government provides health care and education for all Syrians, even the opposition. Among, among them are my friends who are against the government and they go to uh, public uh, universities and public uh, uh, hospitals and uh, the government takes uh, take care, care of them. But when you have half the international community is fighting against you, there are international uh, intelligence agencies, the CIA in Britain, in in France, in Germany, they are all fighting against uh, against one Syrian government, and uh, you have over 80 nationalities fighting against you. It's very normal to have insecurity in Syria. And, why do you uh, think? Why do you think they're fighting against you? Syria. I mean, wh how do you expect? One person in, in, in Manchester caused, caused all this panic. And how do sure. you think but let me uh, ask the you, Syrian government Kevok, why do you think, against why do you think tens all of these thousands countries, of fighters? Why do you think all these countries are undermining the Syrian government? Might it be that they see a situation where there's a, for, for, where, there's a, where, there's a, where there's a leader who's barrel bombing his people into non-existence? Might that be no. one reason? No, 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 no. It's, it is all about geopolitical, uh, it's, it's a geopolitical conflict. One, in order to isolate Iran uh, from, uh, from Lebanon, in order to cut uh, the, uh, the, the road um, between, uh, between Tehran and Damascus, to cut the excess of resistance in the region, but also in order to isolate uh, Russia from the Mediterranean Sea. This is all about uh, a geopolitical conflict, but also about the gas pipeline war in Syria happening. Uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia want to extend their pipelines to Syria, to Turkey, and then to Europe in order to target the Russian pipelines uh, uh, supplying the gas to Europe. This is not about human rights and democracy. They toppled uh, 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 Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. Is there a democracy there? In, in, in Yemen, is there a democracy? Or in Iraq, is there a democracy? The Western governments have no interest to build a real democratic systems in, in the Middle East. Their interest is to build a puppet government to, have, to dictate on them what they do. Look what happened in Saudi Arabia. Is there more shameful thing to do to pay hundreds of billions of dollars to the United States? And for what? In order to fight an illusionist and, and a fake okay. enemy, which is Iran and Syria. All these weapons will fight very soon against the Syrian government, against Hezbollah, and against Iran. I have one final question for Kawa Hassan. Broadly speaking, is the Middle East becoming an ever-shrinking geography for Christians? Is it a place where Christians can still exist and thrive, or is that going away? Unfortunately, if, you know, uh, the current uh, situation in the Middle East is really very, very dangerous and frightening for Christians, for minorities, but also for majorities. We should not forget also the majorities, you know, who are also victims of authoritarian regimes and apocalyptic jihadi groups like ISIS. I think all groups are, you know, under threat from both these, these two, uh, you know, authoritarian, uh, authoritarian uh, trends in the region. Okay, Kevok Almasian and Kawa Hassan. It's an important conversation to have. Thank you both for joining us. Coming up on the program, an activist is arrested for refusing to give up his passwords at Heathrow Airport.
Welcome back to the Newsmakers. The British advocacy group CAGE has been at the centre of controversy over its work on behalf of suspected terrorists, who the group says are caught up in unfair anti-terror laws. Now the organisation finds itself having to advocate on behalf of its own director. Shweb Hassan reports. They've been campaigning against such laws for years and now one of their own has been caught in the net. In conducting Mohammed Rabbani is a director for the CAGE Human Rights Advocacy Group. He was detained while at Heathrow Airport last month for refusing to let officials examine his phone and laptop. When the police asked me, I reassured them on numerous occasions that there's nothing unlawful in my devices and I'm actually comfortable in showing them if they really, really insist. But I again reiterated that what may be on my devices is in connection to the work that I do. And they know where I work. I mean, I'm part of CAGE. CAGE has a long history in conducting investigations and assisting victims of torture and abuse. Almost all our former inmates of Guantanamo Bay. Others were held at secret CIA black sites across the world. Rights groups say they are in fact victims of extraordinary rendition, as in the case of British citizen Mozambique, one of the first cases taken up by Cage. Falsely accused of being an Al-Qaeda operative, he was later tortured and interrogated under the supervision of MI5 agents. Baig was eventually released without charge and settled a compensation complaint against the UK government worth millions of dollars. He now works for CAGE and campaigns against such renditions. But security officials argue that CAGE's work brings the group into contact with what they say are potential and current terrorists and their contacts. The authorities point to the recent example of Mohammed Imwazi, also known as Jihadi John. This notorious Daesh militant of British origin was responsible for torturing and beheading several people. While Cage argues that it's such stereotyping that pushes young alienated people towards extremism, UK authorities say the law allows them to monitor contacts with terror groups and anyone who refuses to cooperate will be prosecuted. That's why Mohammed Rabbani has now been charged under the terror law. Cage says it intends to fight the charges, stressing that it's necessary to protect the privacy of its clients. Shoaib Hassan, the newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Somerset, UK, is international security analyst Bob Ayers, and from Brighton, the chief executive of the Ramadan Foundation, Mohammed Shafiq. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Bob Ayers, let's begin with you. Should Mohammed Rabbani have given up his password? If he wanted to get into the UK, yes. Uh, the Section 7 of the Terrorist Act allows border security officials to examine devices and demand passwords to those devices. That's a UK law. And the fact that the cage director chose to come into the UK knowing that was the law, uh, you know, he doesn't have much grounds to stand on saying that they shouldn't have asked him because under UK law, they're authorized to ask him. They did and he refused. Okay, so Mohammed Shafiq, he disobeyed the law, and that's why he's in trouble. Well, I think if they wanted to know what he was tweeting, they could have just gone on the pub Twitter public uh, page. This is more than uh, about Cage and uh, its director. It's about freedom of speech in this country. Yes, as we know, if there are people involved in terrorism or extremism, then if there is an evidence-based approach, then, yeah, I actually agree uh, with the proposal to stop people and ask them to share that information. But if there's no evidence whatsoever um, a person is involved in terrorism or extremism, you ask them for their passwords without any basis, um, I think is stretching it mm -hmm. far uh, too wide. And I think that's the problem with this whole approach from this government we have here in the UK. Uh, it's very quick to talk about draconian le uh, legislation that impedes on civil liberties, impedes on uh, freedom of speech, but is very reluctant to talk about engaging the Muslim community okay, on issues so Mohammed, let me ask that are you. relevant to our society. Sure, let me ask so you. Let's Schedule deal 7. with the issue of terrorism. Let's deal with the issue of extremism, okay. but don't penalise every single Muslim. So, s Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act, are you against Schedule 7, or do you feel they've misinterpreted it, Mohammed? <clears throat> 
Um, <clears throat> I, I'm against. Uh, I'm against the counter-terrorism proposals that tarnish every single Muslim, that makes every single Muslim um, a suspect in this battle against terrorism. I'm against the fact that Muslims en masse are tarnished by the actions of a very small minority. Okay, but, but let's not talk yes, about Muslims en masse. Let's talk about Muhammad Rabbani. Uh, he's, he's, so he's a director of CAGE, right? Cage. Well, Mohammed Rabbani. Sure, not, uh, sure. But I mean, Mohammed Rabbani is not a terrorist. Yeah, but but again, we're not talking not about the extremist. entire Muslim community having been stopped and asked for their passwords. His advocacy work. I'm asking you about the very specific case here in this well, instance. Ma with respect, Mohammed Rabbani is not a terrorist. He's not an extremist. He's I've not, not said involved he's a in that sort of activity. Yes, is he involved in challenging counter-terrorism legislation? Is he involved in tackling? the lack of civil liberties afforded to certain Muslims in this country? Yes, he is. Is he a, a, a hinder to the authorities? Yes, he is. But he operates within the law of this country. He's a peaceful citizen who's advocating for his clients. And we should be very careful right. when we you know, start labeling people as extremists or terrorists without any foundation. OK, but they haven't so far. Bob Ayers, let's look at it from this perspective. He still hasn't been charged. They kept him for more than 24 hours. Then they let him go. He still hasn't been charged. And you have this case where isn't giving up your password very similar to uh, someone, say, conducting a, a wiretap on your phone. You have to have a court order. You have to have some sort of evidence or some sort of proof that the person's involved in criminal activity in order to get that warrant, right? You're, you're confusing different situations. Tell me you why. Can, you can apply for a warrant to tap a phone against the person inside the UK. And that warrant can be granted by various officials. The case here was that the cage director was not in the UK yet. He was crossing but the he's border. A UK, he's a UK citizen. And isn't he also protected by the Data Protection Act, according to the law? Stand by. Stand by. I'm a UK citizen. And I've had my laptop examined when I traveled to the United States by US authorities. That doesn't make me a Muslim. It doesn't make me a terrorist. Would you give up your password? Of course. Of course. Now, I would point out one thing. If this laptop had extremely sensitive information on it about terrorists and about the things that the organization was doing to try to counteract some of the laws they don't like, then that information, it shouldn't be put on a laptop. The laptop can be stolen. Mm -hmm. It can be lost. It can be damaged. A much better way to protect that information would be to leave it on a server somewhere else. And once you're inside the UK, access it as you need, not carry it with you. And the argument that says the man trying to come into the UK said, I'm not a terrorist, trust me. I mean, that's kind of a silly argument. What kind of a terrorist coming into the UK is going to say, I'm a terrorist, I think you should arrest me? OK, what so let's, let's take one of your points. Wait. Let me jump in, take one of your points and pose it to Mohammed. There's, there's a good point there, right? If this was as sensitive as is claimed by Mohammed Rabani, and I'm going to quote him directly, it included information uh, as inf information relevant to a case of torture involving the US government. So if there's something involving whistleblowing or evidence of authorities doing something terrible, why on earth would he have that on a laptop? He needed to be smarter than that, right? Would you agree with that, Mohammed? Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Uh, obviously, sensitive, confidential information around your clients, <coughs> excuse me, is something that should be protected. And, and there are ways you can do that without having that information on the laptop. But, you know, the idea that, mu that the term Muslim is somehow a dirty word for somehow somebody who says they're Muslim somehow equates to terrorism. You know, Muslims are uh, the, the, the forefront of the fight against terrorism. We are the victims, you know, day after day. You, you, in Turkey, how many cases have we had where there are so many Muslims being killed? Let me, uh, let me focus again on cage because so I don't want, I don't want to go into a civilizational discussion about Muslims. Our faith, Muhammad, uh, is a problem with Muhammad, issue around terrorism. Yes, Muslims, yes. Muslims are Sorry? killed. Muslims are killed by Daesh in, in greater numbers than anyone else. Granted, right? But I want to focus again on Cage. Might this be because of Cage's controversial background? So when you have, for example, Asim Qureshi refusing to condemn uh, stoning to death for fornication, when you, when you have a report that comes out and said Mwazi was a beautiful human being, that sort of thing, might Cage's um, history preceded it and might that have been the reason they were targeting him? Do you think it's the case, Mohammed? Well, I think that some of the things that you just referred to are obviously things that many of us within the British Muslim community opposed at the time. You know, we don't think it was right for Cage to do that.
particularly because their work is vital. Uh, they've made a huge contribution in terms of tackling the issue around torture, uh, around the fact that Muslims have been treated as uh, terrorists without any due process. I think all their work, advocacy work, um, has been forgotten because of those mistakes. But that just, that in itself is not justification uh, for you to treat somebody as a criminal. Uh, is Mohammed Rabani involved in terrorism? No. Is he involved in extremism? No. Is he involved in advocating for uh, people who are uh, being tortured? Yes, he is. And then should he be free to represent his clients in the best way he sees fit? Yes, he should. But, you know, don't tarnish every single Muslim based on the actions uh, of these terrorist groups, which obviously they don't represent our faith anyway. Bob, does that sound reasonable to you? Well, I think the, uh, the other guest is expanding to a very global problem. I mean, we have a very, very finite and well-defined issue here, and that is a man traveling into the U.K., got to the U.K. border point, and was asked to surrender the password to his laptop. Now, whether the man was a Muslim, a Jewish rabbi, a Catholic priest, or a cannibal from Fiji, it makes no difference. Sure, but how the many Catholic priests and how many cannibals from Fiji do they actually stop? Let's, let's talk frankly, Bob. Exactly. Well, let's, let's talk about Catholic priests. Remember the little problem we had in the UK called the Troubles, in which the IRA was bombing in London? There are a lot of Catholic religious people that were affiliated with the IRA. But the point are is... You, what, are you what, seriously telling what, me you're seeing priests stopped at the airport and asked well, for their we, passwords? We had, I mean, we had Americans well, who were raising funds. Let, let, let's, let, but, if you want to talk about yeah, facts, okay, if you want to talk that's about That's the 70s facts, and 80s. Let's, let's talk about today. Let's talk about today. American Bob, in the context of today... Who were funding Mohammed, the IRA. Give us, give so, us a second. You know, Bob, in the context of today, that. would you accept that there's some profiling going on, Bob? Profiling is illegal in the UK. Now, let's, let's examine the, the claims that... This man, uh, if somebody would have done some research on him and looked up what he's done in the past and looked up his history, they would have realized that he probably wasn't a threat. But now let's look at the reality of the world on the UK borders. Those people that are checking people into the UK, they're checking in hundreds of thousands of people throughout all of the airports every day. They don't have time to sit down at a computer and do research on every passenger that's arriving. That's why the law empowers them to ask for passwords at the point of entry. Now, you may not like the law. Mm -hmm. You may think it's repulsive. Mm -hmm. You may think it's repressive. You may think it's that's intrusive. That's a ludicrous argument. Okay, so that's the law. Mohammed, come in. B Bob, let's give Mohammed a chance. Mohammed? Well, the, the, yeah, I think that's a ludicrous argument to use just because the resources are not there. We have intelligence agencies. We have no-fly list. We have people uh, who are suspected of being involved in uh, terrorism or per plotting in regards to terrorist uh, atrocities who are under uh, surveillance. So, you know, the idea that somebody who was under surveillance appears at an airport and you can't flag him out because uh, of that is just not true. Let's be very clear. Anybody who is involved in uh, terrorism and extremism. I support the intelligence agencies and the police, the border agency, everybody concerned to take action against those individuals. But you still but think, Mohammed, that asking anyone whether... actions against sure. the people and organize it. Well, let, let me finish, okay, let me finish, finish the point. sentence before you interject. Okay. Um, if you uh, want to take uh, action against those individuals, that's fine. I support that. I don't have a problem with that. But as long as it's based on evidence and it's driven by intelligence and not, uh, you know, suspect and, and uh, you know, a prejudice or in some cases just, you know, just profiling, which in reality happens. OK, so you're OK with it up until the point where they ask anyone for a password, whether that's a Muslim or, or non-Muslim. Is that how I hear it, Mohammed? No, no, I'm just saying it's got to be intelligence-led. It's got to be evidence-led. You can't have a situation where, you know, randomly people have been stopped just because they have a, they have a beard or they're wearing a headscarf or they happen to be of a, a Muslim or foreign-sounding name. Um, is there evidence that Mr. Joe Bloggs is involved in uh, facilitating terrorism or funding for terrorism? Uh, that's a legitimate reason to stop mm -hmm. that person. But Mr. Rabani wasn't stopped because of that. They just wanted to get into his laptop to get some of his secrets, and I think that's wrong. OK, I'll let that be the final word, because we have run out of time. We've got to move on. But, gentlemen, it's been good to talk to both of you, Bob Ayers and Mohammed Shafiq. Thank you very much. This tiny Mediterranean state filling big shoes amid a growing scandal 
and an increasing reputation as a tax haven. Now a new report claims that Malta has become a pirate base for tax evaders in the EU. The so-called Malta files are an investigation into a leaked cache of 150,000 documents. An investigation by 49 journalists in 16 countries into tax evasion, money laundering and corruption. The files claim to show how Malta profits from the advantages of EU membership, while also welcoming large companies and wealthy private clients looking to dodge taxes, depriving other countries of around $2 billion per year. The Malta files come in the same week as German authorities announced a probe into 2,000 companies registered in Malta under suspicion of fraud following an anonymous tip. But Prime Minister Joseph Muscat says the Malta files' revelations aren't that revealing, stressing they expose no secrets and that the claims of offshore companies are factually incorrect. He says Malta's tax system is competitive, not a haven. But this is just the latest scandal to hit Muscat. After mounting pressure, he called a snap election a year out from the end of his term. Last year, the Panama Papers revealed his health and energy minister and chief of staff held offshore companies. Recently, a prominent blogger alleged that Muscat's wife is the beneficial owner of a company which has links to the daughter of the president of Azerbaijan. There are also accusations his chief of staff received kickbacks for giving citizenship to three Russian nationals. Muscat denies all the allegations, and they are now subject to magisterial inquiries. But the accusations are taking their toll. Malta has tumbled 10 places in Transparency International's Corruption Index, its lowest ever ranking. And the image of Malta as a backdoor into the EU has Muscat facing growing rebellion in Brussels. Malta currently holds the EU's rotating presidency at a time when the bloc is trying to crank down on tax avoidance and evasion. Malta has been criticised for being slow to push for tax reform, and some MEPs have said that the country is risking the EU's credibility. The journalists behind the Malta files say they will be rolling out more reports over the next two weeks more potentially damaging revelations as Malta prepares to go to the polls. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. China's State Security Department investigates and handles, in accordance with the relevant Chinese law, groups, people and activities that harm China's national security interests and effectively performs its duties. As for China's State Security Department performing its regular duties, I do not make any further comment. The Chinese government has systematically identified, captured and killed up to 20 informants working for the CIA effectively crippling America's spy network in the country. The New York Times reports that China started targeting the agents as early as 2010 when the informants were outed. How their identities were uncovered is not exactly known. Some theorize that there was a mole in the U.S. government. Others think hackers targeted the CIA's communication systems. And a few believe the U.S. intelligence community has been sloppy in protecting its sources. Well, joining me now from Washington, D.C., is former CIA operations officer Philip Giraldi. Thanks so much for joining us. So it was a compelling New York Times read. Uh, I'm sure you read it as well. Was there enough proof in there that this actually happened and that China killed CIA informants? Well, I think it's uh, quite clear that it actually happened. Uh, the, the, the question is, how did it happen? And there are, of course, a number of theories that are being floated. The, uh, the one uh, of there possibly being a mole is, is the most attractive in terms of uh, a story. Uh, but I have a feeling that uh, what we really saw here was uh, a case of incompetence in terms of uh, how the CIA communicated with its agents in China or how it recruited them. And so incompetence is probably the most plausible in your eyes. Tell me why. Is the CIA that incompetent? Well, the CIA is no more incompetent than, than other intelligence agencies. And you have to realize that the fundamental problem for an intelligence agency after it recruits someone and sends them into a country that has a high security level is how do you communicate with them? And communications are very often the downfall. There have been a number 
of these cases where whole networks of intelligence uh, assets, we would refer to them as, uh, have been either arrested or killed uh, or otherwise maltreated uh, because the communications failed. Uh, I would think that in this case they were communicating uh, electronically with their agents in China. And of course the Chinese are quite good at electronics themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now it seems as if they weren't foreign spies or even U.S. citizens. It seems as if they were Chinese nationals. That's what I'm getting from the New York Times article. Does that mean that they are of the highest value possible because they are actually Chinese citizens? Well, that's a, that's a difficult assessment to make. It, it depends very much on um, who they were, what the intention of having them was. I think certainly there would, there would be spies in, in terms of uh, uh, the Chinese defense industries, the Chinese nuclear program. Uh, hopefully you would want somebody who would have access to political decision making, that sort of thing. But it's difficult to judge. Yeah, so at least a dozen killed and 18 out of the 20 remaining imprisoned according to the report. But then, you know, there's some other various theories regarding the numbers. Would the U.S. have done the same to Chinese spies? Uh, well, of course, I, I, I would hope that the U.S. would not kill them. Uh, but it certainly would uh, do its best to identify them and arrest them and put them in prison for the rest of their lives. So th this would be the, the commensurate action by the U.S. government. But certainly spying is, is serious business, mm -hmm. and it's a high-risk business. So it doesn't surprise me at all to, to read this report, to hear about this uh, possible Chinese action. And we're talking about a 24-month period from 2010 to 2012. There's been five years since then. Has there been any noticeable shift in the relationship between the United States and China. Is there anything you're thinking of and going, ah, oh, that makes sense now, given that we know this happened in 2012? Well, again, I think you would have to know uh, who the spies were and what kind of access they had. Uh, I certainly haven't, but I'm not, I'm far from an expert on, on uh, Chinese matters. I follow the Middle East a lot more and developments in Europe. So um, I would suspect there certainly must have been some things that in retrospect, if we knew who the spies were, we would realize that decision making was different. Mm -hmm. uh, at least one hopes so, because that is the reason why one has an intelligence agency in the first place. Yeah, so the Chinese haven't really come out and kind of admitted to this fully, but they've been dangling a few interesting things out there. There's an editorial in China's Global Times they don't have the freest press out there. This is an excerpt of what was said in there. If this article is telling the truth, we would like to applaud China's anti-espionage activities. Not only was the CIA's spy network dismantled, but Washington had no idea what happened and which pie of the spy, part of the spy network had gone wrong. It can be taken as a sweeping victory. Is that just, you know, normal propaganda or is there something more to that? Well, it's partly propaganda. It's partly patting themselves on their own backs to show what a good job they did. But, you know, as I say, spying is a high-risk business. It's uh, for the people who do the spying. It's uh, seen as something that's in the national interest and uh, that is a uh, preemptive, offensive step against countries that are adversaries. For those who are on the receiving end of spying, of course, it's seen quite differently. It's seen as the, seen as the ultimate betrayal. It's seen as treason. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, yeah. uh, it, depending on where you're reading the article, that will be the spin you'll get. Yeah, and I want to kind of just kind of rewind and go back to what you said about sloppiness and suspecting maybe a communications mishap or, or using that as, as, as the way to communicate with the spies. Is the CIA behind all the other networks when it comes to this sort of thing. I mean, we saw the, the North Koreans hack Sony and we've seen other countries get involved in this. When it comes to hacking and when it comes to communications, digital communications, is the CIA no longer at the cutting edge of this? Well, the CIA is, is almost certainly at the cutting edge of this, but so is everybody else. I mean, this is, these technologies are accessible to uh, anyone who has the time and money to invest in, in trying to uh, develop systems and develop ways to break them. So this is what to bear in mind. And I think the other point that I, I made is um, should be something you should be thinking about. Um, the CIA basically recruits uh, its agents 
in certain ways. And, you know, if you figure out where the way is or what the mechanism is, for example, if the Chinese had arrested a scientist who studied at Stanford, they will suddenly start looking at all people who went to Stanford to study. It's, it's kind of a, uh, you set a pattern, and once the pattern is set, it makes you vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And politically, when we watch Hollywood movies about, about spies, about spies being found out and so on, we understand a lot of them through the context of the Cold War. When we read about or watch Soviet spies and American spies, we think, okay, there's a Cold War between these two superpowers. That's why they're spying on each other. In this day and age, does America need to be spying on China, who's not a foe, maybe it's not a great ally, but it's not a foe, does it need to be spying on China at that level with that uh, depth of penetration? Well, this, of course, is a long-running debate in the United States that the intelligence agencies are much too big, they try to do too much, and they spy when it's not really a national interest. And this leads to embarrassment when agents are caught, when agents are executed, uh, more than embarrassment when they're executed. So I would say that the, uh, the United States does indeed spy too much. It uh, should be spying in terms of its own interests, but they have to be clearly identified interests and not just random operations going out to collect information. That really is not very important. Mm -hmm. It's been great to tap into your experience, uh, Philip Giraldi. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Next time, we debate whether Brazil's president should be impeached again. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.